morning, and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church. We believe that God keeps us connected even while we're apart. And so even in a time like this, we can come together in this kind of space and worship together as a family, as the people of God. This morning, as we begin worship, I just want to invite you to come with a heart prepared to worship. Come open to what the Holy Spirit might do in this time and invite, in, in fact, in, expect the Holy Spirit to come. As we begin worship this morning, I'm going to read a psalm to us, a, a psalm that will invite us to worship uh, and just begin our time together. So let's uh, hear the word of the Lord and begin our, our time of worship. This is our call to worship from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his people. We are the people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's begin worship together. Hello, everyone. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good wherever we happen to be. I'm really glad you're here today. Let me share with you a story uh, from uh, my childhood. Some of you have heard me tell this before, but when I was a little kid, a very little kid, I got lost in the supermarket. My mom dragged me to the supermarket. She said I had two choices that day. I could either go to the supermarket with her or I could go to the supermarket with her. And so I chose the second choice. I went to the supermarket with her. And I suffered through all of the aisles in the supermarket that every kid has to suffer through. The produce area, fruits and vegetables. What kid wants to look at fruits and vegetables for an hour? And then we'd go down the cleaning aisle where I saw nothing but Mr. Clean in my dreams for the next three weeks. And there was aisle after aisle of things I just was not interested in. And then things picked up. Because firstly, there was the cracker aisle. And I had a little interest in crackers. But then we turned the corner at the end cap and went down the next aisle, the cookie aisle. And I was in Nirvana, little kid Nirvana. There were Chips Ahoy, there were Oreos, there were Oreo double stuffs, there were Oreos with different color filling. They had Oreos, they had Oreos, oh my Lord, they had Oreos that were dipped in chocolate. And I stood there wondering which of these cookie bags was I going to ask mom for? And when I decided on the chocolate-covered Oreos, I turned to my mom and said, Mom, and she wasn't there. I, I looked around. My mom was gone. I didn't think I was looking at the Oreos that long, but she was gone. And, you know, human beings are, are the only species that run faster when they're lost. So I started running, looking for my mom. Mom, where are you? I'd run down one aisle. She wasn't there. Out to the main aisle. She wasn't there. I turned the corner, back down through Mr. Clean aisle. She wasn't there. I was really getting upset. I thought, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in this supermarket. And as I turned another uh, end cap and was getting ready to go down the aisle, I heard my mom's voice, Eddie. I turned around, and there she was. And I ran up to her, and I kind of jumped on the end of the cart. I said, I thought you were going to leave me here. And she laughed. She said, I knew I'd find you. And I can't tell you how good it felt to know that not only was I found, 
but I was going home. I wasn't going to have to spend the rest of my life in the produce aisle. Our parable today is the parable of the lost coin, Luke 15, verses 8 to 10. And in it, Jesus talks about a similar event of lostness. In fact, in this whole chapter, he's talking about lost things. He talks about a lost sheep before this passage. He talks about lost sons after this passage. And remember, uh, as we get ready to read this, uh, for those of you who are new with us, I know that there are a few people who, who said this was going to be their first uh, uh, viewing of our online worship this week. Um, when Jesus tells a parable, he's telling uh, a story from everyday life in the first century because that's when he walked the earth. That's when his listeners were living. And it's designed to capture their attention right away. And then there are one or two, sometimes three takeaways that the listeners can apply directly to their lives immediately. So as we read, just be kind of looking for what those possible takeaways are. So we're in Luke chapter 15, verses 8 to 10. Now again, he's talking in the midst of lost things, so verse 8 continues a thought. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, we read in the parable that the woman discussed has lost a coin. Now, in our 21st century culture, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. We don't have much respect for coins. People see coins on the ground all the time, and they walk right by them. They don't even pick them up. I do, but lots of people don't. When we're in a store and the computers go down and the cashiers have to take exact change, we all get kind of grumpy about that because nobody likes to deal with coins in our culture. We'd all rather just swipe our card. But in this first century poor, destitute, agrarian culture that this woman was in. Everything you had was important. Uh, most likely, it was a Greek drachma that she lost, which was the equivalent to one day's wages uh, for most people at the time. But in her, in her village, they, they probably didn't even use currency all that much. They just traded for goods that they needed with other goods that they had. But even though they did that most of the time, you still needed a nest egg, some kind of, of currency to help you in a very difficult time. And what we read in this passage is this woman has lost 10% of her currency. So this is a very significant problem she's got. I mean, I ask you, if at some point you lost 10% of your net worth, would you get a little nervous? Yeah, most of us would get a little nervous, and she was upset. So she lit a lamp, and she took out her broom to look for this coin that she had lost in her house. Now, keep in mind, in the first century, a house was one story, and it was either one, two, maybe rarely three rooms. And in a house in the first century, in a village like this, there, was, there were no windows, and the floor was dirt. So she lit a lamp, a little dim lamp for some light, and she had her broom to sweep around the dirt floor looking for this coin. Now, this is, that's not an easy task at all. So she's in a dire circumstance, and in order to undo the circumstance, she has to do something very difficult. But she would not quit. The scripture says she searched diligently. And not only was she trying to, to reestablish her, her wealth, her, her foundational nest egg, but this coin was probably part of something bigger. That is, if she was a Bedouin woman, which she probably wasn't, but if she was, the coin would be part of a number of coins that were worn across her veil. If she was a village woman, which is much more likely because she's in a house, that 
coin was part of a necklace of other coins that she would wear around her neck under her clothes for safekeeping. Uh, much like some of you who travel internationally wear your passports around your neck because it's close to you. That's kind of the idea of, of what she was doing with these coins on a necklace. So this woman is not just trying to establish her financial security again. She is trying to restore something that's incomplete. Something is off. Something is out of whack in her life. And she's trying to br bring completeness back to her life. And so she searches, and she searches, and she searches. You see, this woman is on a mission of restoration. And then after the last chair is moved, the last swipe of the broom is taken. She sees the glint of the coin because of the dim lamp that she lit. And she reaches down, pulls it out of the dirt, she looks at it. Yep, that's it. <sighs> she tries to clean it up. And she replaces it back on her necklace and places that back under her clothing. You see, her financial security is restored but she's also brought completion to her household. She's brought completion to her life status. That coin was supposed to be close to her, and that's exactly where she restored it to. And then she does something very unique that I can't imagine us doing in the 21st century. And that is because she has found this lost coin. She call, calls all of her friends over to her house to celebrate, to rejoice, to have a party because she's found her lost coin. Now, between you and me, if I had a party for every single time I lost and found my car keys, that's all that I would do all the time. But I imagine that it was a village covered as supper. People would bring things. Uh, someone else would bring an instrument like a lyre, L-Y-R-E, the little harp, not the person who doesn't tell truths. And they would play songs on the lyre, and they would sing songs. And all throughout the night, they would be reminding each other of the time that they lost something like a sheep. And they would reflect on how good they felt when that was restored. Do you remember when I lost my sheep and I found it in the wicket? Yeah. And do you remember when I lost my goat? But it was around the corner and I brought it back. Then a man in the corner with tears coming out of his eyes said, do you remember when I lost my son? But then he came back. Friends, if we let it, even in difficult times, our life can be a wonderful collection of celebrations if we stop always obsessing about the next crisis. So the listeners are right with Jesus the whole time. They're emoting with Jesus in this story because he has drawn them in. They get really sad when they hear the coin is lost. They get really excited when they see that she's found the coin because she know, they know it's not an easy task. They get really, really excited when they hear that there's a party and they're constantly reminding each other back and forth about how wonderful it was to know that something that was lost has been restored once again, it was full of celebration. And Jesus 
puts them in this position. That is, they are, they are listening, they are engaged, they are using their listening skills to their highest ability. He puts them in their, this position to say the next thing. He says, folks, you really get excited about lost things. You get really excited when a sheep gets found. You get really excited when a little drachma is pulled up out of the dirt. Lost things being restored really make you happy. And then he says, imagine how much more excited heaven is when one of you who is lost is found. Now, I know the text literally says there when a sinner repents, but the word repent means to turn around 180 degrees from what you're doing, just as if you were in a supermarket running down one aisle looking for your parent, and then you just turned around and saw her. Imagine, he says, how much heaven rejoices when one of you who was lost is now found. So let's talk about just a couple things that we can pull out of this passage. What are those one or two things that we can apply directly to our lives right now? Well, the first one is this. God does the finding. Think about that coin, that drachma that's under the dirt, in the corner, under a table, in a dark house that can't be seen with the naked eye. There is nothing that that coin can do to help the finder find it. It can't say, over here. It can't say, you're getting warmer. Right behind you. It can't do anything. It is completely dependent on the finder to find it. Now, does that mean that You and I have no responsibility in our faith? Of course not. We're supposed to spend time in prayer. Uh, If you're wondering how to start a prayer life, send me an email, give me a call. I've got a great little way to to start and prime the pump of of your prayer life. Uh, We're supposed to spend time reading God's word. We're supposed to spend time worshiping uh, God uh, with, with God's people which we're doing online right now. We're supposed to be in ministry serving people like our youth group was doing uh, on, their, uh, on their mission uh, event last week. It was, it was wonderful. But there are other things that we have no control over. We can't really control our attitude. We can't really have the motivation to want to get our act together. And even more importantly, We can't change our heart from being selfish to being selfless. In those things, we are as dependent on God as the coin was on the woman to be found. So God does the finding. The other thing I think that we can pull out here is that there will be a great celebration in heaven because of our foundness. There is nothing that gives God greater joy than to find you and me. He loves you. He loves you completely. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you've done or not done. It doesn't matter what you've said or not said. It doesn't matter what you have ignored or not ignored. There is no one who has disqualified themselves from God's love. We just might happen to be right now lost in the dirt in the dark corner. But we have not disqualified ourselves from God seeking us like a woman would with one of her ten lost coins. God loves you. He wants the best for you. He cares for you. And all we have to do is to submit to the process of being found. All we have to do is allow God to find us. 
Because the good news today and every day is that we don't have to hide anymore. Let's pray. Lord, you are great and mighty indeed. In our Western culture, it's so easy for us to believe that we have to do certain things to gain your love, to be worthy of being found. Remind us that you love us. End of sentence. And that you pursue us. Allow, allow us, Lord, to open our lives to the process of being found. To know that even though we feel alone right now, you're looking for us. And we don't have to hide anymore. For that, we will always be grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as the people of God, even though we are gathered virtually, let's worship God together.